Welcome to The Cantankerous Catholic with Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Listen to Joe tackle the really tough moral issues, current events, and politics from a Catholic perspective. Now here's Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Hello again, Six Pack Warriors. Welcome back to The Cantankerous Catholic, episode 198. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. I do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and that I will obey the orders of the President of the United States and the orders of the officers appointed over me, according to the regulation and uniform code of military justice. So help me God. It's got to stop. We're being played for fools by everyone in government from the White House to local county government. I don't know about you, but I don't like being treated like a fool. There's little doubt in anyone's mind that society in America is in a state of entropy and utter chaos. So what are you going to do about it? Wise families are preparing for that real caca hits the fan moment. Most don't know how to do it properly, though. There's so much to think about when preparing to protect your family. It's overwhelming. In How Your Family Can Survive When Society Collapses, I've done all the research for you. In this comprehensive guide, I tell you everything you need to know to be able to protect your family and learn how to live off the grid. In fact, following the things I teach in this book will not only help you to survive, but your family will actually be able to prosper. Get your copy of How Your Family Can Survive When Society Collapses now, today, while there's still time to prepare. You'll find a link in my show notes at cantankerouscatholic.com or you can go to the book section on the Joe's Stuff page. Before I launch into the topic for this episode, I want to mention that we're running out of questions for Bishop Strickland. So please send your questions to joe at cantankerouscatholic.com. When I was a kid, if my sister had been sexually assaulted in the school girl's restroom, if my father hadn't taken the law into his own hands, that boy would have certainly been jailed. My father also would have probably held the school to account for allowing something like this to happen by confronting the school board. 
I'm 100% certain my father would have gotten satisfaction all the way around one way or another, and it wouldn't have been nice. Of course, those were sane times. Today, it's anything but sane in America. In May of last year, a young teenage girl was sexually assaulted in the school restroom for girls. The assault was perpetrated by a 14-year-old boy. Why was the boy even there in the first place? Because in insane America, he identified as a girl and was allowed to use the girl's restroom. Who could have guessed that such a thing might have happened? But that's not where the insanity stops. In June of last year, the girl's father went to the school board meeting to voice his protest, along with other parents, that a biologically male student could use the girl's restroom. There was a subsequent arrest made. Unfortunately, it wasn't the teen predator. It was the victim's father. In what world is that just or even sane? This is no isolated incident. In a later meeting of that same school board, the meeting turned into a shouting match over the use of pronouns. Apparently, the school board is trying to force students to use pronouns other than him and her, he and she. At other school board meetings across the nation, parents are protesting that teachers are grooming their children for LGBT ideologies, their kids are being taught critical race theory, that teachers are telling students that they should question their birth gender, and that school libraries are getting rid of such classics as Tom Sawyer and To Kill a Mockingbird and replacing them with pornographic books on both homosexuality and heterosexuality. In Wentzville, Missouri, near me, there are ongoing disagreements between parents and the school board about banning books kids wouldn't have read before, but now definitely will. And they're based on, what else? Sex. In L.A., you know, in the original land of fruits and nuts. School board meetings have been tense ever since a new rule mandating only the ugly students keep wearing masks. Can you believe that? In Eugene, Oregon, schools are under fire for curriculum focusing on the 1972-74 to 74 years of Grateful Dead's greatest commercial success. What in hell does that have to do with the education of a child? In Glendale, Arizona, teachers are showing LGBT videos to fourth graders. Gee, I can't imagine a parent being upset about that, can you? In Columbus, Ohio, parents want to know what gives teachers the right to determine their kids' education when the teacher focuses on LGBT indoctrination. Hmm, if I had kids in school there, I might just be wondering that myself. Things are getting crazier and crazier in our public schools and state colleges and universities. But the crazies who are doing all this harm to our kids aren't the fool. The fools are us, you and me. Why are we fools? Because we're paying school board members and teachers to do these things to our kids. Let me ask you, if your kid had a sore throat and you took him to a doctor, and if after the examination the doctor told you that the remedy for your kid's illness was to amputate his leg, would you go along with that? Would you even pay for that visit? What if you took your car to a garage to be repaired? You suspect it might need a new starter. The mechanic agrees, but his idea of fixing it is to connect dynamite to the starter. How long would you stay at that garage and trust that mechanic? Would you pay a criminal to break into your home while your family's there and have the criminal molest and kill your kids? That sort of thing is exactly what's happening to our children in our public schools and state colleges. And we're the ones financing it. Last week, I wrote letters to my state senator and representative about this. In part, I wrote, quote, We can listen to any newscast or read any political or social article and see that all our societal and political problems come down to education in one form or another. Critical race theory is being taught in public schools, as is transgenderism and homosexuality. Marxism is prevalent in our state colleges and universities, which is why we have Antifa and Black Lives Matter. We consistently rank near the bottom of educational achievement in Western civilization, and parents are being told that they are not the primary educators of our children. 
I listen to and read these stories. Then I look at my personal property tax bill. I have to ask myself why I'm paying for the indoctrination of young minds in perversion and socialism slash communism and ultimately the destruction of the nation I love and once defended. This is tantamount to hiring a murderer to come into my home and blow my brains out with my own firearm. Only a fool would do that. So paying our personal property taxes, which is mostly for education, to aid and assist in the destruction of our country is a fool's game. Indeed, this form of taxation is making fools of all of us, end quote. What I suggested to the politicians is exactly what I've suggested on this show before. I made it clear that I advocate for the closure of all public schools, but acknowledge that would never happen because parents want to cater to their little snowflakes. So I propose that the legislature should make a new set of laws in an attempt to bring about much-needed education reform. First of all, tenure must be abolished in our state colleges and universities. Now, it's been a long time since I was in public primary and secondary schools, but if tenure exists in those institutions, it should be eliminated there as well. Then, as a condition of employment, all educators, administrators, and staff must sign an oath of allegiance to both the U.S. and state constitutions, as well as any legislated list of compliance requirements. Then, when violations are proven, said violations would result in immediate termination. How will my letters be received by these politicians? I don't know, and I don't care. I demanded in my letters that they respond in writing. If I don't get a response, I'll call them at home, repeatedly. You see, that's the beautiful thing about state senators and representatives. They have to live nearby. While I can't make personal contact with my U.S. senators and representatives, I can definitely become a rock in the shoes of my state senators and representatives. Our responsibility as Catholic patriots, and patriotism is a virtue, is to actively get involved politically to bring about change. And when something such as indoctrination in our taxpayer-funded educational system is so blatantly apparent, we must get involved. In most states, the personal property tax bill comes out in December. I urge every one of you to look carefully at that bill. It should itemize what percentage of your money is being spent on exactly what. You'll notice that in all 50 states, the greatest outlay of money is for education. That not only covers public, primary, and secondary schools, but it includes state colleges and universities as well. Six-pack warriors, you need to speak up to your legislators now. Tell them that you won't tolerate the indoctrination of students in college that brings us destructive groups such as Antifa and Black Lives Matter any longer. Tell them you won't tolerate being forced to pay to have your children groomed for perversion. Tell them it's time for a taxpayer's revolt and you're going to help to lead it. Make these politicians earn their salaries. Make them address these issues. When I went to receive my third degree in the Knights of Columbus, nobody had told me that we'd be quizzed on proficiency in our knowledge of the faith. I thought I might be embarrassed because, well, you know, they were knights after all. I was embarrassed, all right. Embarrassed for the other 50-plus men there. With the exception of two other men, they couldn't answer the most simple catechism questions. Things like, how many sacraments are there and what are the mysteries of the rosary? During the social activities after the degree work, I listened to what the men were saying about what they'd just been through. To my amazement, they actually thought that they'd been asked very advanced catechism questions. That night's Columbus third degree was not an isolated situation. Sadly, at least 95% of American Catholics are wholly or almost wholly ignorant of the Catholic faith. But I'm offering you a remedy for your parishioners. Introducing the What We Believe, Why We Believe It bulletin inserts. Endorsed by Raymond Leo Cardinal Burke, each of these inserts teaches a thumbnail catechism lesson. 
When your parishioners begin to get involved, they'll get many more benefits at a cost of only $19.95 a month to your parish. But you won't start out paying that because I want to give it to you for three months for free just to try it out. Take 11 minutes to watch a video by clicking the link in my show notes that says Six Pack System Bulletin Inserts to learn more. This is a good idea for priests who want to help their parishioners become fully catechized and a lot of lay people get a subscription for their parish as a way to support the parish without giving the bishop any of their money. To learn more, click on the link in my show notes that says Six Pack System Bulletin Inserts. It just requires 11 minutes of your time. It's time for the Sacred Heart Wins with Bishop Joseph Strickland. Each week, His Excellency answers your toughest questions about the Catholic faith, the problems in the church, spiritual questions, catechetical topics, or anything else you want to know. If you have a question, just email it to joe at cantankerouscatholic.com. Now here's Bishop Strickland and Joe Pack, the Every Catholic Guy. Six-Pack Warriors, we're back with Bishop Strickland of Tyler, Texas, for this edition of the Sacred Heart Wins. How are you this week, Excellency? Good, Joe. Good. Glad to be with you. <laughs> Thank you. Diving right in, Joan asks, I recently read that Pope Francis updated the Code of Canon Law to allow a more decentralized approach to the composition of local catechisms. Can you explain how the Pope updates canon law, and can things changed by one Pope be changed by a successor? Well, a um, lot of questions there. Uh, <laughs> as far as some of the, it, it sounds like part of that question is more of an administrative structure that canon law does deal with. And, and certainly those more or less disciplinary or administrative rules can be changed and are changed, especially I worked in the uh, tribunal for years. And there have been numerous changes through, you know, the last 50 years of, of looking at, at how those administrative processes happen and all of that. Um, so that's at a different level of changing canon law than, you know, some of the more doctrinal issues. And Certainly, whoever the Pope is, whether Pope Francis or Pope Benedict, all, all through the ages, the Pope would, even in those administrative situations, would be consulting um, various dicasteries and, and various offices there in the Vatican to determine what needs to be done or what may cha change in procedure or administrative act may happen. Um, and the same thing happens with with other changes to canon law. Um, but so when it comes down to something that is a basic truth of the faith, then, um, you know, I think it, that doesn't change how it's presented. The wording and all may change, um, but the truth doesn't change uh, according to what Jesus has taught us. So, um like I said, there are a lot of questions in there, but huh. there are appropriate procedural changes that every pope would deal with. And, you know, the procedures could be changed again, either maybe moved back or changed even more in, in the same direction by a future pope. The uh, uh, Since this question apparently deals with administrative issues, the pope, as supreme lawgiver, uh, since this doesn't have anything to do with doctrine, he's perfectly free to say any or change, make any changes he wants to make, correct? Correct. Okay. I just wanted to clarify that. Uh, Peter asks, should the church refuse aid from the federal government and give up its tax-exempt status? According to the Internal Revenue Code, Nonprofits can endorse a pro-life candidate who oppose a pro-abort poll like Biden or Pelosi or speak out against trans or gay issues because they are political. 
So the question, should we give up our tax exempt status? Um, well, I don't think we should give up the tax exempt status, but we shouldn't shy away from doing what the job of the church is, is to preach the truth of the gospel to the culture. Um, and frankly, I mean, people say, oh, you're getting political. Is anything not political in the world these days? It's all politicized. But we need to just stay the course and teach the truth. Um, and, you know, if if teaching, the, I'll, I'll put it this way, Joe. If teaching the truth means that certain people running the government are going to take our tax-exempt status, then so be it. But I don't think we need to voluntarily, you know, relinquish that status, which I think is just because the Catholic Church is a, with all our problems, and we've got problems like every church, every organization does, but there's tremendous good that is done in helping. I mean, I know in our small Catholic Charities office here in the diocese, tremendous help to those in need, to those seeking legal immigration avenues, all sorts of good work is done. So um, because that, I mean, that translates really what the church provides as a church community translates into billions of dollars that help our society. So I think that's the rationale for why we have a tax exempt status. And I think we, we need to retain that, but not let it, let retaining it keep us from teaching the truth. Okay, excellent. This next question, <laughs> it has a couple of things in it that I'm entirely too stupid to understand. Uh, but a fellow who uses the handle white wolf at gab.com asks, with public schools operating from a viewpoint that is rooted deeply in behavioral sciences and treating children as mere animals to learn skills for college or career, PBIS, whatever that is, social-emotional learning, removing the study of the classics, etc., what is a Catholic family to do? How would you respond to a parent who knows their public school is promoting practices that are contrary to the faith, but argues that they keep their child enrolled at that school because their children can then evangelize other children? Well, that goes back to... Um the parents being the primary educators, that means the parents have a, pro a real responsibility to be educated themselves and to know the truth and to know their faith and to help guide their children in that. I can understand that, that choice by parents, but they, they would really need to understand their own children and understand that their children um, are well-rooted in the faith and are not going to be harmed by being in that environment. I mean, in, in some ways, we all need to be ready to be in society, which rejects much of what the gospel teaches, and to clearly speak that truth in as constructive a way as we can. So I don't totally disagree with a parent who says, my kids need to stay there and speak up and speak the truth. But they, those parents, you know, love their children. Uh, we presume that and just encourage the parents to not be naive and to, to make sure that their children, if they're going to ask their children to sort of be culture warriors like that, then they have the responsibility of making sure the children are well formed enough that Amen. the culture ultimately doesn't infect them. Amen. You know, I, Frankly, Excellency, I could talk for an hour about any Catholic family who thinks their children need to stay in public school because they'll evangelize other children, but I'll let it go with what you said. <laughs> okay. Jane asks, is it a sin to listen to or share all this information about bad bishops and priests we're hearing on the talk shows? I know we need to be informed about what is going on in our churches, uh, but Jesus says don't talk about his priests even if it's the truth. This is really bothering me lately. I don't recall anywhere in Scripture where Jesus said that, but she does. It, this is becoming a matter of conscience for her, Excellency. 
Well, and I understand the the uh, the heartache that that this at a questioner is dealing with. Um, absolutely, we need to respect the bishops and the priests and the deacons, the ordained clergy of the faith, because they are ordained as ministers of Christ. And and I guess what what I would say is out of respect to call them to the truth. What we have to be very careful about, especially if we hear something on a talk show, I mean, hopefully, Joe, we, we do our best not to point fingers or accuse anyone, to simply say this is the truth that all of us need to be guided by. Um, but if so, it comes down to what the person's knowledge is. If they are aware specifically of ways that a bishop or priest is not um, proclaiming the truth, then they have an obligation to speak up respectfully out of concern and out of support for that member of the clergy. But to be very careful that it's just something you heard on a talk show or something you read on a blog on the Internet, we need to be very cautious of Pat, about judging that something is going on that has been alleged. I mean, it's the same, analogously, the same thing in the government. I mean, you hear so much, it's hard to know what's true. And what we have a moral responsibility to act on is what we know to be true. If you've witnessed something or you have strong enough evidence, then you need to act on it responsibly and in the, the context of, of loving one another as Christ has taught us to. But um, so it's it's delicate and it's hard to to know when to act. But I mean, sadly, you know, a lot of the the abuse crisis in the church, a lot of people said, well, you know, they didn't say a thing about what father was doing because you couldn't speak ill of a priest. When a priest is doing ill, for his sake, you have to speak. Amen. About it. But again, it's a matter of what you know. If your child tells you that something father said or did is wrong and it's it's harming your child and your child has really given you that evidence, you have an obligation as a parent to to speak up. But if it's much more remote than that, and it's just something you've heard on a talk show or read on the Internet, certainly, you know, you can pray about it and be be alerted. But to to really begin, I mean, you know, there is such a thing as calumny where you're you're making false accusations that you don't know to be the truth. So we do have to be careful, but we do have to speak the truth in the circumstances of our own lives. Yeah, the bottom line to this one is it's all an Eighth Commandment issue. And I have been telling my students for years, for me, the most complex commandment of all ten is the Eighth Commandment. It is the most difficult to understand and apply, and I spend significantly more time confessing eighth commandment sins than I do anything else. Would you agree that that's a tough commandment? It is. Absolutely. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, if I ever become a saint, it won't be because I overcame the restrictions on the eighth commandment. <laughs> okay. Six pack warriors. That's it for this edition of the sacred heart wins. We'll see you next week. Excellency, we're looking forward to it. Thanks, Joe. Everyone searches the internet to solve problems or fill needs they have. For many of you, I've already done the heavy lifting. Discounting the evil things search for online, people generally search for things that tell them how to make money online, health and wellness products, and trading and investing. Some are interested in having their own podcast. I've got your back on these things. Visit cantankerouscatholic.com. Go to the episodes page, then click on the title of this episode. Below the podcast player, you'll see my show notes. I've already listed products and services in various groupings. Check them out. 
you can help yourself and this apostolate at the same time because if you like what you see and purchase the products or services, this apostolate will get a small commission. Check out those links today. I am hard, but I am fair. It's time for the Catholic Boot Camp with your drill sergeant, Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Learn the Catholic faith and how to defend it like you've never heard it before. This boot camp is tough, so there's no political correctness, no spirit of Vatican II, and no namby-pamby platitudes. Drill Sergeant Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy, will prepare you for spiritual war. Now here's Joe Sixpack. Jimmy was a 12-year-old boy, ordinarily good and obedient to his parents. But one afternoon, his mother told him he couldn't go swimming. Jimmy went swimming anyway, and his mother found out. When Jimmy returned, his mother told him how disappointed she was over his disobedience. Jimmy told her he was sorry and that he wouldn't do it again. His mother said, well, Jimmy, I forgive your disobedience, but I still have to punish you. You can't ride your bike for a week. Jimmy thought of a way to cut down his punishment. After dinner, he offered to dry the dishes for his mother. This was very unusual if you knew Jimmy. His mother saw right through the plan, but she was good about it, and when he finished, told him, Jimmy, you've been a good boy by drying the dishes for me, so I'll take some time off your punishment. I'll reduce your punishment from a week to four days. God is a very merciful God. In fact, he's perfectly merciful because he's, well, perfect. But because he's perfect, he must also be perfectly just. A fallacy of non-Catholic Christianity that's crept into Catholic thinking is, when God forgives a sin, he also forgets. In other words, it's wrongly believed that when God forgives sin, he also pardons the temporal punishment due to those sins. But this isn't true. That would make God neurotic, imperfect. There still has to be a price paid for the offense, and this is a sense of justice God has given to us as imperfect as we are. After all, that's the whole premise behind our criminal justice system. If a criminal went before a judge and said that he was sorry, it wouldn't be right if the judge simply said, that's okay, the people forgive you, go on home. The same is true of God. He most certainly forgives when we unburden ourselves of our sins and ask forgiveness in the confessional, but he still demands justice. Mortal sins forgiven in the confessional release us from eternal punishment in hell, but both mortal and venial sins that are forgiven still have the price of temporal punishment to be paid. There are only two places where that temporal punishment can take place, here on earth in this life or in purgatory. Most of us don't pay the full price for our sins in this life, so we end up paying for it in purgatory. Purgatory is like hell, but with two differences. The first difference is that we only remain in purgatory until the debt is paid and we are purified until we're perfect. The other difference is that our punishment is most intense when we arrive, but it lessens as we get closer to perfection. Therefore, it makes sense to do all we can to make reparation for our sins so as to escape the temporal punishment of purgatory as best we can. This is best done by the gaining of an indulgence. Indulgences remit all or part of our temporal punishment by doing the works prescribed by the church. There is a partial indulgence which remits a portion of the temporal punishment due to forgiven sin. There is also a plenary indulgence, which remits all the temporal punishment due to forgiven sin. To gain a plenary indulgence, the penitent not only performs the prescribed work, but also fulfills the usual conditions of going to confession and receiving communion within a reasonable time prior to or after the indulgence stack. What Jimmy did was tantamount to a partial indulgence. He did a good work for his mother, and she in turn took away part of the punishment deserved for his disobedience. There is no doubt that Jimmy could have had all his punishment abolished if he'd done something bigger, something truly extraordinary, which would have been like a plenary indulgence. 
Being in a state of grace, praying, and performing good works to gain indulgences will remit the punishment due to forgiven sin. But there is more we can do, as seen in this following story. A French servant girl waited on her old sickly mistress for many years. The rich lady once told her that she'd left large amounts of money and property to her family members in her will, including even her most distant relative. The servant girl, who was both poor and faithful to her mistress, expected some such gift herself, but learned from her mistress that she wasn't even in the old lady's will at all. Shortly before her mistress died, she gave the girl a crucifix made of painted plaster. She said, And this is the gift I leave you as a sign of my love and appreciation for all you've done for me over the years. And thanked her mistress, but she was terribly disappointed. Only a crucifix, she thought, and hung the cross over her bed and prayed before it each night before retiring. But as she prayed, she couldn't help but feel some bitterness and resentment about so meager a gift. One night, she thought, I've been faithful to my mistress all these years, yet all I get from her is a cross. She gives great amounts of money and property to all these other people who haven't even been to visit her or care about her in the least. Oh, God, is that just? Don't I deserve more for all my work and patience and care of this woman? Her bitterness led Anne into a fit of anger. She jerked the crucifix from the wall and smashed it onto the floor in a thousand pieces as she shouted, I don't want your gift, madam. There is your cross in pieces at my feet. But as Anne looked at the pieces on the floor, her eyes widened. There on the floor, among all the broken pieces of the crucifix, were many beautiful diamonds. Good God, she cried, burying her face in her hand. Good God, have mercy on me. Forgive me for having been so ungrateful, rude, and bitter. Anne ran from the room to apologize to her mistress. She knocked at the door of the bedroom, but there was no answer. She went into the room and approached the bed, only to find her aged mistress dead. In this story, Anne felt bitter and angry because she felt unjustly treated by her mistress. It was only when she discovered the diamonds that she realized her mistress had indeed treated her well. We're all like Anne far more often than we like to think. None of us like to experience the difficulties in life. We become upset, impatient, or even angry over the crosses God allows to come in our way, especially when they seem unjust. That merely shows how foolish and ungrateful we can be. When God sends us a cross to bear, he's really sending us a handful of diamonds. Those crosses are gifts to help us get to heaven. If, instead of being impatient or angry about a cross, we were to patiently bear it and offer it back to God as a gift and reparation for our sins and the sins of the world, we'd not only accomplish the remission of some of our temporal punishment, but we'd also grow in holiness in the sight of God and man. So don't waste any of your suffering. Thank God for it and offer it back to him in reparation for the offenses made against him by the world and yourself. The church tells us you will benefit for it in this life and the next. Learn things about the Catholic faith you never knew in Joe Sixpack's Secrets of the Catholic Faith. There are many essentials to our holy and ancient faith that few modern Catholics know. Those essentials have become, well, secrets, hence the title Secrets of the Catholic Faith. Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy, is always exciting, never boring, and completely politically incorrect. He never shies away from the so-called untouchable moral issues. With his use of humor and directness, readers and students can never get enough of what he teaches. According to Joe, there isn't one single teaching of the Catholic Church that can't be completely demonstrated to an inquiring mind. Everything can be demonstrated. But the Catholic laity aren't being taught these things. They're being fed pablum when they need and want meat. Secrets of the Catholic Faith is actually exciting, and it will make any Catholic's chest swell with pride. So get your copy of Secrets of the Catholic Faith by Joe Sixpack, the Every Catholic Guy, today in print or ebook on Amazon, Apple Books, Barnes and Noble, and Kobo. The 
Catholic Church is 2,000 years old. A lot of wisdom is gained over two millennia. Each week we'll share some of that wisdom with a Catholic quote. So here's this week's Catholic quote. This week's Catholic quote is from St. John Chrysostom. He said, When the Mass is being celebrated, the sanctuary is filled with countless angels who adore the divine victim emulated on the altar. I believe a really great way to teach the faith is through stories, parables, and anecdotes. So here's today's story. A knight was on his way to take part in a tournament. On his arm was his lady's shield. His lady was the Blessed Virgin Mary. Whatever glory he won, he'd offer to her. It was the Feast of the Assumption of Mary. As he drew near the field of tournament, he stopped to hear Mass. The Mass was followed by another Mass. The night stayed on. And when still another Mass began, he was so loyal to Mary that he stayed at his devotions to honor her feast day. His servant urged him to leave. The tournament must have already begun. However, the knight found that he couldn't desert Our Lady at her altar while Mass was going on. When the last prayer had been said, he strode from the church, mounted his horse, and headed for the fields of honor. But the crowds were already leaving when he got there. They hailed him as the glorious victor. To his surprise, he learned that the highest honors on the field that day had gone to him, the knight with Our Lady's shield. And he came to realize that while he'd been serving Our Lady at Mass on her feast day, she'd been taking his place on the field of honor. The knight was rewarded for his devotion to Our Lady. She'll also fight your battles if you'll only trust and honor her as your mother. The best way of honoring Our Lady is not only to go to Mass on her feast days, but especially to keep your heart free of sin and to love Holy Mass and to frequent Holy Communion. Be loyal to your heavenly queen, and when life is over, you'll be the victor and gloriously rewarded. This has been The Cantankerous Catholic with Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Thanks for subscribing, and be sure to visit cantankerouscatholic.com to get your free copy of Joe's popular book, The Best of What We Believe, Why We Believe It.